Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the eighth meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask you please all to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent? Apologies have been received uh, from two people. Jamie Green, a committee member, is tied up in a meeting in the chamber and is unable to attend. So, John Scott, I'd like to welcome you as his substitute to the committee. And Donald Cameron, who would be attending as a reporter for the E. CCLR committee is unable to attend for the same reason and there is no substitute. We're going to move straight on to agenda item one which is taking evidence on salmon farming in Scotland. As with all of these sessions I would like to ask members around the table to declare an interest and I'm going to start it off by saying I declared last week a lengthy declaration of my interest in relation to this which I don't propose to repeat but I would refer members and uh, other interested parties to that declaration and to my declaration of interest which shows I am a member of a uh, sorry I am a co-owner of a uh, wild salmon fishery in Scotland would anyone else like to make a declaration of interest uh, John I feel I should just declare an interest as a farmer and this appearance in front of this committee, but I have nothing to declare relevant to today's proceedings. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I'm then going to move on. This is our second evidence session on the Committee's Salmon Farming in Scotland inquiry, and we're going to take evidence today from environmental and fisheries organisations. I'd like to welcome John Gibb, the clerk to the Lochaba District Salmon Fishery Board, uh, Dr Alan Wells, Chief Executive of Fisheries Management Scotland, Richard Luxmore, the Senior Nature Conservation Advisor at the National Trust for Scotland on behalf of the Scottish Environmental Link, and Guy Lindley Adams, Solicitor on behalf of Salmon and Trout Conservation Questions. We're going, uh, sorry, Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland. We are now going to move on to questions. I jumped ahead of myself. And the first question uh, today is from John. Uh, thanks very much, uh, convener, and um, we'll be looking at different areas, but to start off with so, uh, economic and other potential benefits, we've heard from HIE and others about the number of jobs that are linked to uh, salmon farming in particular. They've given a figure of 10,340 jobs. Uh, so I was wondering, um, are there estimates as to what the benefits are from the wild fisheries, sea trout and salmon, um, either both in economic terms, but other, either other social or uh, cultural benefits or, or anything else from the wild side? Um, I should have set the ground rules at the beginning. For those of you that haven't given evidence before, I think you all have at some stage. You don't need to touch any of the buttons in front of you. If you want to come in and answer a question, look at me and I will try and bring you in at the relevant point. Please then don't look away for the rest of the meeting and continue to talk because I will then have to interrupt you. If you keep an eye on me, I will give you an indication uh, whether I want to bring somebody else in. So I apologise, I should have done that at the beginning. And Alan, you seem to have got the hang of it straight away, so I'll bring you in uh, to answer that question to start with. Alan. So just in terms of the, the economics of uh, salmon and sea trout fisheries, there was a, a report um, published in March 2017. Now, unfortunately, that didn't break down those economics on a regional basis, but it did give Scotland wide figures, so I can give you a, a, an indication of those figures. So. Um, that was a report done for the Scottish Government by a company called PASEC and it said that Scotland-wide economic imp impact assessment of wild fisheries indicates around £135 million of angler expenditure, 4,300 full-time equivalent jobs and £79.9 .9 million of gross value added and that was in 2014 figures. So this gives you an indication of, uh, of the relative size of the industries. And are there other benefits apart from just the purely economic ones? Sure, there's, there, there, there are all sorts of uh, social, so, social benefits from, from, uh, from, from angling and, and, and participation. We're, we're, we're kind of blessed in Scotland in some ways in, in as much as um, because of the geography of where Scotland sits, we have a very long season. Um, so we, can, we have rivers uh, open for fishing really from uh, January all the way through to November, which is not the case in other parts. Uh, in, in Norway, it tends to be during the, sum, the, the summer season. So we can benefit from, from, from tourism, from anglers coming in from other countries and, and, and benefiting, benefiting from that long season. Do the tourists kind of fly in, fish and fly out again, or do they do other things as well? It's very dependent. Um, uh, that, that, that has been looked at, but I don't know precisely the, the, the details from that from the PACEC report, but certainly there, there, there are a range of, range of things. Um, 
Anglers quite often bring their families who, who potentially do other things if they're not interested in fishing themselves. Some people will come in for a week, some people will fish when the water's good, maybe do other things when, uh, when conditions aren't quite so good. Okay. Uh, John. Yeah, no. I also uh, think that we shouldn't underestimate the cultural importance of salmon, irrespective of angling. Um, I find quite often I'm standing on the river and it's quite a lot of um, public walkways on some of the rivers that I manage and you'll meet someone, had one last year, I remember an old lady stopped me and said, isn't it wonderful to see the salmon back? You know, and I don't think we should underestimate this. It's not just about angling, it's not just about, um, you know, commercial value of that, but actually the, it's, in the, it's in the sort of blood of the West Highlanders to have salmon in the rivers. And the second part to my question then, uh, following on, would be, I mean, we clearly have had a lot of uh, emails and information uh, on both sides of this uh, discussion, if you like, on behalf of the salmon farms and on behalf of the wild fisheries. Um, I mean, as a general question, is it possible that we have both, that we can have successful wild fisheries and successful salmon farming, or do you think we have to choose one or the other? Um, I'm going to bring Guy in. I, I noticed, Alan and John, you both want to come in as well, but I'll try and spread it out a bit to start with Guy, if you'd like to start on that. Uh, from the point of view of the Salmon Trout Conservation of Scotland, the answer is definitely yes. I mean, the, the, it, we're often labelled as an organisation that is anti-fish farming. That, that isn't correct. Uh, I think it's perfectly possible for the two to coexist. Um, as the Eclair report indicated, we are concerned about the sustainable development of the industry to make sure that it exists within environmental limits, but as a, as a simple principle, there is absolutely no reason why the two sectors can't coexist and both thrive. Okay, John, do you want to come back on that? Because it, you, I think you live with the interreaction where mm. you are. I think um, we're certainly, as a fishery board on the West Coast, in the middle of the West Coast, we're most certainly of the view that there, there will be a place, we're not there yet, but there will be a place where both sectors can thrive. And it's not, it's not beyond possibility that we might get to a place where, I mean, fish farming like forestry, like hydro, like any man-made activity is going to be a risk. And I think we have to accept that. It's quantifying that risk and it's minimising that risk. And I don't think we're there at the moment. And I think that's a lot to do with location, but we can obviously get onto that later. But I don't think it's unreasonable to, to think there might be a place in the future, if we do this right, where fish farming might say have a, to put a number on it, um, wildly a 10% impact on wild salmon and sea trout stocks, but through working together and through um, projects to protect and enhance salmon and sea, wild salmon and sea trout stocks, we might be able to boost that by say 20%. So, you know, that's, it's a not unreasonable place to try and find, I think. We're not there at the moment though. Okay, Alan. I thought it might be useful to put some sort of context uh, around uh, where we are on, on, on fish farming in relation to wild fish. Fisheries Management Scotland is the representative body for the District Salmon Fishery Boards and the, the Charitable Fishery Trusts across Scotland. And uh, we have a, a committee that looks at this, uh, this issue in particular. And what we would like to see is essentially f four bullet points, thriving salmon and sea trout populations and fisheries without negative impacts arising from salmon fishing. A harmonious local coexistence, and this is an important point, with an industry that understands the importance of being a good neighbour and communicates openly and transparently with stakeholders. A world-leading regulatory and planning system which protects wild fish and proactively seeks to address any local negative impacts. An investment of a proportion of any profits generated by the industry into the protection and improvement of local salmon and sea trout populations and fisheries. So just to give you some context for where we're coming from from this, and uh, we can expand on that later on in the session if possible. Thank you. Um, yes, Peter. Just a, just a wee bit of clarity. You mentioned 4,300 jobs uh, dependent on the wild fisheries. I assume that's hotels and tackle shops and the wider economy that you're including in that figure. It's, it's, not, it's not my figure, but yes, that figure takes into account the full, the, the, the full uh, the range of those sort of jobs. So it's not, not necessarily direct employment within fisheries and fishing yeah. and management. Very good. Thank, thanks. Okay. Um, the next question then is from Fulton. Uh, good morning, panel. My uh, question uh, is, is around disease and the spread of disease. Is there any um, solid evidence that shows that disease can be spread between wild and farmed salmon? So, who'd like to start off on that? 
Um, Guy, do you want to start off with that? Well, means. I mean, by disease, if you include parasites within that, then then definitely yes. Um, just before the Eclair Committee um, looks at the environmental impacts, Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland commissioned Nina, the Norwegian um, Nature Conservation uh, Research Unit, to look at this, and, and they came to the conclusion that there is significant evidence of an impact of sea lice from salmon farms on wild salmonid populations. It's difficult to point to a particular lock and say a particular farm is causing a particular problem, but uh, they came to the conclusion there's a per pervasive and general effect of fish farming in relation to wild salmonid populations with respect to sea lice. Now, um, I, I personally am concerned that we concentrate on sea lice because we can see them, because we can count them. There are other diseases of uh, salmon, salmonids that you get in salmon farms. There isn't much evidence as to whether those viral diseases, those bacterial diseases, cause an impact on the wild salmonid populations. And I suspect, uh, Alan will probably uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that the research um, that would be required to do that work would be extremely difficult. So uh, I think what you can say is that diseases within fish farms are not likely to be positive for the wild salmonid population. They may be neutral. But the sea lice problem, we know, is not neutral. Well, I, I'll, I'll just say on that just now, because the next, my next uh, sort of question was about populations. I, as somebody who doesn't know a lot about the salmon industry and coming to this uh, fresh, what, what, can you put that in a context of me, for me? What, what, is, what, what effect in the population would it have in terms of numbers? Population of wild salmon. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to, to, to interrupt. I, I, I would try and steer the panel at the moment because we are coming on to a section on sea lice a little bit later. Okay. I, I if we, if we could know. try and focus this on disease, which is, is where Fulton started. So if I could encourage you on disease. Um, sorry, Fulton, do you want, uh, Guy, do you want to come back to Fulton on that, on disease? I'm uh, happy to leave that until the sea lice section. Okay. Uh, Alan, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. I, I think... I wouldn't disagree much with what was said last week in terms of disease. It's incredibly difficult to try and assess in, in, in the wild population without doing massive sampling efforts. If fish are, are, are badly affected by disease, then they will die and they will go in. I think the term black box was used last week and, and you just simply can't sample them. Um, there has been some small sampling done by, by Marine Scotland Science. You may wish to ask them. I don't want to put words in their mouth. My understanding is they haven't found much evidence of disease in wild fish. But again, the problem is actually sampling a representative sample. The other issue I would say that, that's relevant to, to disease and to wild fish is, is to a certain extent, this is a, this is a numbers game. The actual number of vectors for disease in relative between the farm today, salmon industry and the wild salmon industry is, is quite significant. So in the SAMS report, they, that they stated that in 2014, about 179,000 tonnes and 48 million smolts were put to sea in terms of aquaculture. And they compared that with about 0.6 million wild fish right the way across Scotland. So the actual number of individuals uh, is wildly different between the two sectors. And that's a big issue, both in terms of disease and in, t in, in terms of uh, sea lice, which I'm sure we'll come on to. Does, any, does anyone, sorry, John, do you want to come in on that? Going to ask panel, do you see climate change having any impact on the spread of diseases from warmer waters? I, I, <laughs> I keep looking at everyone up there. Don't, don't, be, don't be shy to catch my eye if you want to come in. Al, Alan's quite quick at it. He's obviously done this before. Alan, if you'd like to answer that. <laughs> Only once. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think in terms of climate change, certainly the, the, the industry feel that they, they, are, they are seeing more of a challenge from, from some of the gill health issues that were mentioned in the, in, in the Environment Committee because of rising uh, um, um, seawater temperatures. That may well be the case for wild fish, but I don't think there's any evidence that we can sort of point to one way or the other for the reasons that I mentioned earlier on. Um, in terms of wild fish populations, climate change is almost certainly an issue in terms of uh, the, the, their, their ability to find food in the marine environment. Um, we know that there have been phase shifts of uh, plankton, the sort of things that, that fish eat, which have moved maybe a thousand kilometres to the north. So that is a big, big, big effect on, on wild fish. But specific to disease, I, I don't think there's much evidence either way. Stuart, you'd like to come in, and then I'll come back to you, Fulton. If it's one. just a very narrow point related to this. 
Um, Martin Jaffis had, uh, describes a, a reduced salinity event, which I don't think was to do with climate change by his account, which had a significant impact. But I think it is accepted that in climate change terms, such events will happen from that source in future. Is that likely, if that occurs, and the increased temperature, is that likely to move fish to colder waters further north or have other effects? Because the desalinity that's been described uh, looked quite serious, even though the reduced salinity was not particularly marked. I, I haven't seen the particular comment from, from, from Martin Jaffa in terms of reduced salinity. Um, I don't know whether that refers to at the open sea or, or, or at the head of a sea lock, where maybe you have uh, extra uh, fresh water input in, if you've got a in, particularly in, wet summer or something yeah. like that. In, so. in fairness, it was a lock. Right. And it wasn't local effect. It was a, an effect of change of global currents. As he describes it, I speak to nothing about the science uh, person. You might want to ask him about that. I don't know. No, that's okay. Um, Fulton, do you want to push? Yeah. <clears throat> Just a sort of general question in, in terms of the um, the disease spread that you've <clears throat> that you've mentioned. Apologies. Uh, what are the social economic implications of that for the for wild fisheries? <laughs> Still the only I'm, one. I, I'm in the hot seat. Um, I guess my answer, I would, I would look back, and it's actually looking back beyond my time in this sector, but uh, back uh, a few decades ago, there was an outbreak of, of a disease called ulceral dermal necrosis within wild fish, which was a, a big issue. John, John may well want to talk about this, which was a big issue and was a big worry at the time. Um, there was signs a few years ago that it might have might have reappeared and there was a big response from the wild fish sector at that time and we even uh, we even funded a phd student to look at it as it turned out it wasn't udn that happened that time but if you had a big disease which which had a, a big big impact on wild fish and particularly taking into account the relative strength of stocks that we have at the moment uh, of, of, of wild fish then it would be a big concern do you, do you want to mention that? Yeah, not, not to add anything particularly significant to that, but that's right. I mean, the uh, last few years, the last decade or so, in, um, I should stress, not, nothing to do with aquaculture. This is purely a disease in wild fish um, that certain rivers, um, more so on the east coast and the west coast, um, and particularly rivers where early spring salmon, um, that's usually sort of April, May salmon, come in, and then the river dries up and they're constricted in pools. Um, you have a high density of fish in small pools. They have started to see and continue to see um, this uh, UDN type uh, disease or at least the symptoms in UDN. They get a saprolegnia fungus, which is like a white um, fungal growth on the fish and, and, and they succumb to it. And so you can actually have situations where you have rivers uh, literally full of dead fish, which as you can imagine, is not particularly good for the marketing of fishing um, and um, it, it, it could have a, a long-term impact and it could well be linked to climate change but the, the truth is as Alan says we, a, we don't really know what it is it, it's not UDN um, and we don't really know entirely what's causing it but they appear to be picking it up at sea bringing it in and if environmental conditions allow it to thrive which is low water in the late spring early summer um, it can be a significant problem. And has there been any analysis done on what the, uh, let's come back to the question, what the social and economic uh, consequences for the wild fisheries and the wild fishing industry is of that and, uh, and any other spread? I don't think that was covered in the, in, in the PACET report. They did look at various sort of scenarios, but I don't think disease in particular was looked at in that. Um, but I mean, I, I suppose you could, you, you could draw numbers based on, on on catches and what would happen to relative catches and all the rest of it but it's not quite as it's, it's not quite as black and white as that because people will will fish and uh, not necessarily catch something but will still come back and fish in times so other people have different uh, different um, drivers so it, it really depends on individuals okay that's all i think we'll move on to the next section um and that is uh, Rich, richard lyle uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Following on F Fulton McGregor's question, uh, I've got similar uh, to drill down. The clear report stated the committee is concerned that disease is still leading to large numbers of farm fish being slaughtered. They were and, and are concerned that salmon mortality will increase if production is doubled, considers full, uh, fish health problems 
should be addressed across the sector with a relative decline in mortality rates. Um, and I'm drawn to the fact that Marine Scotland said throughout the 90s and the two th in year 2000s, there were around 20% of mortality of farm fish throughout the production cycle, and this has seemed to increase. Do you agree and do you share the Eclairs Committee's concern about the environmental impacts of disease in terms of rear fish and slaughtered fish? And how are they disposed of? And to you, is 20% an unacceptable figure. Who'd, who'd like to start on that? Richard. Um, the issue of, of how many um, fish die on fish farms is um, it's obviously um, a, a, waste of, a waste of good food, but it's primarily a, a welfare issue. Um, to some extent, if all the fish die within a fish farm, from an environmental perspective, that may not necessarily have an impact on the, the environment outside the fish farm, and it's just a, a commercial problem for the, the farm itself. Um, obviously, the, the, the problems arise if the causes of death, diseases or something, then transfer to the environment outside the farm. So from an environmental perspective, it's the transfer of disease from the farm to the um, wild fish or the environment round about, which is the problem. The issue of disposal of, of um, dead fish is um, the same as disposal of, of any waste, and, and clearly that needs to be clearly, closely regulated um, and, and the, the regulations enforced. We had on that point, uh, convener, we had reports of, of dead fish on the back of a lorry, yeah. which uh, was said in a, a newspaper, I think I read, yeah. and that was totally denied that basically, oh no, we put it inside a container and we transport it away and dispose of it uh, very, uh, very well. well. Is that the case? Um, I'm sure the efforts are made to try and transport things carefully, but I mean, I've also seen television footage of stuff dripping out of the back of these lorries and having smelt pits full of dead salmon, it's not very pleasant to be very close to it. So. I think that is of concern, and it would be exactly the same if it was a truck full of dead cows. You would be worried about that. To come in, and then just, Alan. Just to reiterate what, what Richard's saying, the, the, the mortality within a farm isn't necessarily of a concern to wild fish populations unless there is some vector leaving that farm and infecting the, the wild population. So if you think of the farm as, as a black box, as long as what is within that black box is contained... It's still an issue for animal welfare. It's still an issue for, for, for the farmers. But what it does indicate is if there is a disease problem, high mortality problem, then, then the management of the farm isn't right. And uh, as I said before in answer to um, uh, an earlier question, it, it's indicative of a problem. It's unlikely to be positive for the wild fish that this mortality level is occurring within the farms. I was going to make a, a, a similar point, really, but... Um it's, it's the underlying reasons for that mortality and the potential consequences to wild fish which are important and there's clearly more research that needs to be done to understand that because we just don't know enough about it at the moment. Right, basically, you know, I, I agree, you know, if I was a, a fish farmer and 20% of my stock was getting lost every year, I'd, I'd seriously be doing something about it. Anyway, I'll move on. Um, do you have any um, examples or can you share any examples from other countries of how this challenge might be better addressed. Who'd like to uh, start on that? Guy. Uh, perhaps one uh, medium long-term solution is, and it's often raised, is the, is the solution of closed containment. If you isolate your farmed fish biologically uh, from the wider environment, you're less likely to get the diseases in in the first place. And we see closed containment projects popping up in, in Norway. Uh, by closed containment, I don't just mean land-based closed containment, I mean floating closed containment units, which have clearly be of greater significance in Scotland. Um, so I think it, one of the messages from the Eclair uh, Committee report was that investment incentivising closed containment, rapid research, anything the Scottish Government can do to push us down that path would be very welcome. John, do you want to come on, on that? I wanted to come in and, I mean, I 
<coughs> perhaps declare that I actually am a registered fish farmer with a license, but it, albeit for restocking purposes. So, you know, I, I do actually, um, I grow fish. And I think, um, just to take a step back to your previous point, I, I think it's fair um, to mention that the salmon, by its very nature, um, produces many, many thousands of eggs, each individual, and there's a natural erosion. So I think, although, um, you know, it's, it's tempting to look at very high mortality and compare it to sheep or pigs or something like that, it's an entirely different thing. Now, whether um, I would agree with the other um, uh, witnesses that um, it's indicative of a problem, but I think, to be fair, I mean, as I, I run a farm, I know that you do get wastage and it's a very natural thing, and I would be probably happier, as I know the industry used to have a figure of around 10%, not 20%. Right, so you think it's quite acceptable? Richard, sorry, sorry can I just ask a question on that before you go yeah. on to the next one? Just so I understand, John, as, 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 being a fish farmer, uh, by what you're saying, do you get 20% losses in your fish farm, or is it... I, is it I have is to it say, um, no, I don't. Um, I run a very small operation, but I do get significant losses. But... Um, you know, I don't want to be drawn too much on whether 20% is acceptable or not. I, you know, if I had to be, I would say it, it does seem rather high, and it's, but it's not the, as uh, representing wild fish interests, the fact that uh, the, the methods they use to transport dead fish or, you know, that's not, that's not what's affecting us. I mean, it is perhaps indicative of an underlying problem, and I don't think that's something that the, uh, the fish farm companies would necessarily shy away from. But if I could just drill down on that, that question, if you'll let me convene it. If I was a farmer and I was losing X amount of cows, cattle, whatever, I would do something about it. So as a fish farmer, is there nothing that they can do about it? Say they, you know, and, and Norway is colder. My view, Norway has uh, fjords and a lot of fjords uh, throughout, or fjords, whatever you want to call it, say it the way you want to say it. Um, and basically, it's a, it's a different sort of, setting my view and i support salmon farming by the way before anyone comes back to me i want to see it doubled and i want to but i want to say why do we have 20 percent take that plus the escapes you know we're losing 30 40 percent of our production no one in their wildest dreams should be should be should have that that level so you know i think it's unacceptable uh, mr gibb you know do you think it's unacceptable? Uh, just to clarify, bring you in, and then I'm going to bring Richard in because yeah. I notice he wants to come in yeah. as well. Just, so, John, just to clarify, it's a, it's a number that you know, and, and managing well fisheries that we're not at all comfortable with, and I would clarify that. My point before was simply that it is a different species. So, to compare sheep and and salmon is perhaps a little unfair. That was my only point on that. But as Guy has already said, I think the only way to guarantee. Um, what you seek is to have uh, close containment and complete separation from the wild and the farm stock. Richard, if you'd like to come in and then I'll bring Stuart in. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, it's already been mentioned, but rather than concentrating on, you know, whether 20% is acceptable or 40% is acceptable, is actually to look at the overall trends and the trends of, of mortality on fish farms have been inexorably rising over the last four or five years. Um, and now, fair enough, there's a range of different diseases that have been causing that mortality. But the fact that the diseases have been, in, the, the rate of mortality have been increasing suggests that the industry, far from getting closer to being able to control those diseases, is actually getting further away from being able to control those diseases. So the problem is actually getting worse. There have been a number of questions, comments about various things being uh, improving within the industry, but the one thing that's absolutely clear is the problem of mortality is getting worse, and therefore the, the ability to, con and that's indicative that the ability to control these diseases is getting worse. A, a proportion of the uh, fish that die in fish farms will be dying from disease, uh, and I just wondered if there was any evidence, and I haven't heard any to date, uh, of the transporting of these dead fish to ultimate disposal, uh, causing a biological crossover of disease infection to wild fish or otherwise, if there's any evidence. Richard, if you'd like to come in and then Alan. Well, all I was going to say was I'm not aware of any evidence. Yeah, that's fine. 
I'm not aware of any evidence either, but I am aware that two or three of my members were, were quite concerned because they witnessed the sort of leakage that we saw on, on TV, and in one instance that leakage was quite close to a salmon river. Okay. Um, now, the, the local authority was contacted at the time, but I don't know what happened about that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Th Sorry, John. Yeah. Can I just ask the experts if there's any one disease in particular that's causing um, this unacceptable level of deaths on fish farms? Is it, is it the gill disease? Is it the storm of a, a new disease that can ravage any type of farming, well, sheep or cattle, and until such time as it's controlled? Is it predominantly gill disease, or is it another? I'm not all that well informed in that regard, but you will doubtless tell me. Guy, if you'd like yes. to start on that. Uh, as I understand it, gill disease is one of the major causes of this mortality, combined with the application of, of mechanical treatments for sea lice. Now, when your, your fish are already uh, compromised in some way by the gill disease they carry, then putting them through quite a stressful mechanical treatment for sea lice causes the levels of mortality. Uh, also, the mechanical treatments for sea lice are, are new. They, the farmers are still getting used to them. Uh, and so there, there is a level of mortality there. So it's, it's, it's no one particular disease, but obviously the gill disease has caused a, a, a serious problem for them in the last couple of years. Um, I understand that some of the closed close containment technologies that draw water from lower, um, deeper in, into the cages could deal with the, um, the sea lice getting into the cages in the first place, which would then make the gill disease easier to treat. So there, there, there are complex relationships between the diseases going on and the different treatments being applied. Alan. I think it's, uh, it's quite a difficult one for us to, uh, to, to, to comment on. There are various reports from the Fish Health Inspectorate, so it might well be worth asking, uh, asking them and indeed the, the salmon farmers about this. But I think, I think the gill issues that, that, that the fish farmers have been experiencing aren't, aren't actually a single disease. There are a range of challenges, I think they were discussed as, as last week. So there's amoebic gill disease, which is one, one of those gill challenges. But if you have jellyfish or other things like, like that, which can actually physically irritate the gills and all the rest of it, that can exacerbate the problem as well. Um, I recall, and it might be worth just having a quick look, in the, in the spice briefing there was, there was some information from Marine Harvest uh, from their annual report which, 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 which set out some of the, the challenges, but I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what, what, what those were. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, Peter, that's you. Yes, thank you, convener, and good morning, gentlemen. Um, obviously what we're interested in is the interaction between fish farming and wild fish. And there is some concern that numbers of wild fish in the East Coast rivers are, are under some pressure as well. And, and, you know, there are no fish farms in the east, east uh, coast of, the, of Scotland. And just to quote uh, a North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organisation, they said, wild stocks of Atlantic salmon are currently vulnerable because of reduced marine survival all around the North Atlantic. So my question really is, would salmon, wild salmon, be in decline both in east and west coast rivers if there were no salmon farming going on? Would there still be this pressure on wild stocks regardless? I'm going to start off with Alan and get a, get, go to John and then I'll see if anyone else wants to come in. So, Alan. I think it's worth emphasising um, Fisheries Management Scotland used to be the Association of Salmon Fishery Boards. It's never been our position either as Fishery Management Scotland or previously, that, that fish farming is the only problem, the only, uh, the, the, the only pressure that wild fish face. There's a whole series of them. And I mentioned earlier on that, 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 that the marine issues, and, and again, I'll mention the black box, are, are, are a significant problem, whether it's East Coast, whether it's West Coast, whether it's Norway, whether it's anywhere in the range of the Atlantic salmon. In terms of sea lice, though, the work that has been done to look at the, the, the effect is able to look at those things in isolation. So I don't want to go in a big, long um, explanation about how it's worked, but essentially what they've done is they've taken two cohorts of fish and released them into the wild, one of which has been prophylactically treated against sea lice to protect those fish from sea lice, and the other one isn't. It's the control. control. Now, all of those other pressures that happen in the marine environment would, would affect both of those experimental groups equally. 
And what those, those uh, experiments have shown, and they've been done in Norway and in Ireland, and, uh, uh, is that on average, and there's a lot of variation within it, about 20% um, um, less fish return to rivers in the, group which, uh, in the control group as opposed to those which have been treated for sea lice. So what you can do is you can look at the issue of sea lice in isolation from mm. all of those other effects, mm. which do affect both of those groups equally. Um, there's a lot of discussion last week about whether we could read across from Norway over to here and uh, a lot of discussion about all of the things that make Norway different and I don't disagree with any of those. Norway has a much, a very different geography, a different level of production and all the rest of it. But so does Ireland. Ireland has a much smaller industry than we have in, than we have in Scotland. It doesn't have the sort of fjordic sea loss that we have here or the big fjords that they have in Norway. Um, and yet the same experiments that have been done in Norway which point to a, around about, on average, a 20% uh, reduction in, in returning adults coming back to the rivers, have also been done in Ireland, and they saw broadly the same thing. So actually, although I agree with everything that was said in terms of the differences between Norway and Scotland last week, I don't agree with the conclusion that we can't draw broadly from the, the results of those, uh, those studies. Mm. What's important, though, is knowing what happens at a very local level, because we don't manage sea lice on a Scotland-wide level or a Norway level. We manage them at very much at a local level. We also don't manage salmon stocks at a Scotland level. We manage them on an individual river level. So what's actually important is, what ha is what's happening very much in the local level as the fish are passing out of the rivers, passing mm. past those farms. Mm. John, would you like to come in? And then I'm going to bring Stuart in, and I'll then come to Guy. Yeah, just briefly, um, I think I uh, very much concur with Alan that uh, we've never seen aquaculture as a you know, the main culprit in the decline of salmon and sea trout. However, I think what's clear is that um, it's most certainly adding an extra pressure to already threatened stocks. Um, you may, however, Alan mentioned uh, the way you can try and tease out the, uh, the impact of sea lice using um, treated and untreated experiments. Um, uh, Marine Scotland Science have been doing some work on this in one of the catchments that I manage on the River Lockie, and you may wish to ask them about that work. Um, because that, um, only on a local level, may give some answers. And my understanding, I mean, I'll let them speak for their own work, but my understanding is it actually has demonstrated that um, marine survival rates are extremely poor on parts of the West Coast, and certainly in my region of Loch Haber. And you won't find this on the East Coast of Scotland if we're making any comparisons. You actually now have rivers that could, could simply be classed as extinct of Atlantic salmon. Um, we had the River Coe, which you'll probably know runs through the middle of Glencoe, um, had one salmon red in it um, this year, that we, as far as we could count. Um, so that suggests that it may have been one pair of salmon in that whole river. That used to be a thriving river. Um, the same as the River Leven at Kinloch Leven. Um, absolutely no salmon caught, absolutely no salmon seen. Um, we are seeing a new period of de decline, certainly in parts of the West Coast. Stuart, do you want to come in? And then I, I noticed you nodding as well, Richard, so I'd like to try and bring you all in on this, if, if I may, Stuart. Uh, I just want to address this to Dr. Wells and the scientific research he's, he's cited. What conclusion should we derive, and is the conclusion that that scientific test has told us about the effect of lice on wild fish at sea? In other words, given that it's a reduction in returning fish. Uh, should we infer that the mortality is occurring at sea and that lice are the vector of that mortality? Uh, it, is, is that what we should conclude? So therefore, does that detach the effect of uh, farms with lice from that effect which is occurring at sea, or am I misinterpreting it? I haven't read the research, which I'm sure, of course, Dr. Wells will have done. Yeah. Alan, I, if I, you want to come I, in. I, I should maybe mention my, my postdoctoral research was, uh, was on interactions between uh, um, farmed and, and wild fish, and I, I was involved in an EU-funded project in Norway, Scotland, and Ireland, so that, that, that's my background. I'm not sure I entirely understand your question. Sea lice only exist in the marine environment, so it can only happen at sea. They, they die if they go into fresh water. No, um, I, can, I, can I attempt then, with the community's consent? I, I absolutely understand uh, the, 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 the reference group and the prophylactically treated group and how they, you're testing whether going to sea uh, 
uh, by which I mean being distant from the river, I which see. spawned okay. them, is what I'm yeah. meaning when I say that, that the effect that's being measured is what happens to those uh, animals when they are distant yeah. from their spawning river. That's and I'm merely asking, the, the, there are naturally, of course, lice well offshore in salt water, and I understand the point about lice are salt water uh, animals. Are we actually not ending up testing how these animals respond to lice distant from farms? In other words, it's the natural background level of lice rather than so anything else. Just, just before you answer that, Alan, perhaps it would be useful just to explain, uh, as part of your answer, the effect of lice on fish going to sea and the effect of lice on fish returning to the river. Yeah. Because yes. I, I, I think it would just clarify the, 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 the debate here. Yeah. Alan, sorry. So, so very, very happy to address both of those. The important point in terms of sea lice and wild fish is that um, it's the smolts, it's the young fish leaving the rivers are where, where we see the impact. We know from long-term studies that have been done by the University of St Andrews and uh, Marine Scotland Science on the north coast of Scotland from the net fisheries that uh, large multi-sea winter fish and one sea winter fish are grills that come back to the Scottish coast regularly come back with really quite high levels of sea lice with no apparent uh, physiological difficulties. There's a big difference between a large fish coping with a number of, of lice than, than a small fish. Um, some of the work that I was doing was on the physiology of, 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 of fish and the effects that sea lice have on, on those fish. And it causes all sorts of problems. It causes problems with their ability to regulate salt and water balance. It causes problems in relation to the way that their gills function, the way that their um, um, livers function and all sorts of things like that. So basically what you're doing is um, if you have a large infection of, of sea lice onto a fish, you're taking a point where actually it's going through a major physiological change because it's going from fresh water to seawater it's completely restructuring its gills many of its organs are working in completely opposite ways and you're adding an extra stressor on top of that and it's that extra stress which is the the, the problem now whether those fish then die because of the, the number of sea lice or whether it's a secondary reason because they're more susceptible to predation and all the rest of it comes into that black box argument but what we know from these prophylactic treatments is if you treat the fish then they will survive better. Now, in terms of the, whether it happens at high sea or whether it happens closer to the shore, the chances are that it happens closer to the shore because those prophylactic treatments are time limited. Yeah. They last a, a matter of weeks rather than years or months. So, yes, we, we understand that it's a, a relatively close to shore phenomenon. Uh, just a tiny wee thing. I, we've heard black box used. My definition of a black box is a container whose inputs and outputs are known, but whose internal processes are unknown or irrelevant. Is that the definition that we are using as witnesses? Uh, what I'm essentially saying is we don't know what happens once the fish get out into the marine environment because it's impossible to sample them. Whether that's a black box or whether that's something else, I don't know. I'm going to bring in Guy, um, and I think, Richard, you wanted to add something as well. Guy. If I could just add to what Alan um, mentioned about um, it being a problem, sea lice being a problem for departing smolts, the, the wouldn't want the committee to forget that it's also a problem for sea trout in that their habit is much more coastal, and it's ju uh, juveniles and adults. They stay near the farms, so they are uh, exposed to the sea lice from the farms in, in a way that the adult salmon further out at sea won't be. Can, um, can, I, can I just... Sorry. Do forgive me, just a tiny bit of point. Does that change the proportion of potential sea trout who go to sea? Because some return and become brown trout, of course. There is certainly a, a, a problem with what's known as early returning behaviour. So yeah. sea trout exposed to sea lice will return to the river because they right. appreciate that the lice will, will drop off. But, but I, I would imagine John and Alan would be better placed to talk about the, the detailed biology of that. Rich, do you want to come in on that? Uh, John, I, I wasn't sure if you were catching my eye. Yeah, you are catching my eye. Richard. I, I was really just wanting to draw attention to the difference between salmon and sea trout because salmon, certainly in relation to fish farms, if, if you have a fish farm near the mouth of the river, the salmon smolts go past it on the way out, disappear off to sea, and they, while they're passing, they can pick up sea, tr uh, sea lice. But sea trout, are, when they go to sea, are in the vicinity of f f fish farms, 
for the whole of their lifetime, life cycle in the sea and are therefore much more at risk from picking up infections. And equally, when a salmon returns to the river, yes, it passes a fish farm, but if it picks up any lice at that point, it doesn't really matter much because it's going straight into the fresh water when all the lice will die. So it's really it's a problem for the smolts of the salmon and a problem for the adults of the sea trout, and it's a completely different issue for the two. John, do you want to come in and then I'll come back to Peter? Two, two brief points, if I may, um, just for a bit of clarity on, on smolts and sea lice, wild smolts and sea lice. One has to think back to a time before we had aquaculture in the sea lochs of Scotland. And on the west coast, um, unlike the east coast of Scotland, west coast adult salmon don't tend to run till around May. So nature designed it, we believe, in that way, that the adult wild salmon, who carry sea lice totally naturally, do not cross over with the smolts leaving a river. But what we've actually done over the decades with aquaculture is we've basically put hundreds of thousands of adult salmon in the way of a creature that is not used to meeting sea lice. And I think that's just for clarity. Um, so therefore, one might conclude that the only way of avoiding that is you either move them out of the way of the migrating smolt or you separate them. Um, but to go back to the point on, um, which is an um, important point on uh, trout and sea trout, um, certainly we've got a, a lot of evidence, anecdotal and written up, that uh, when sea trout meet sea lice at sea, as guys alluded to, you get this early returning behaviour. It may be, uh, and I, 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 I don't have a lot of evidence to back this up apart from anecdotal evidence, but it may well be that over time now, over what is essentially three decades, you may well be seeing many of those fish actually staying in freshwater. And there's a lot of evidence that in freshwater lochs, particularly where you have freshwater smolt farms, you have um, very much increased stocks, uh, populations of resident brown trout, um, which in themselves uh, uh, slightly cause an imbalance and in themselves may cause a predation risk to salmon. So we may have skewed the freshwater environment in that way. Um, Alan, I'm going to just bring you in in a minute. Uh, Peter, could you? I think you've got further questions you'd like to push on this. Mm. So, Peter. Yeah, obviously there, there's a there's a categorisation uh, for for the health of the salmon rivers or, or just rivers in general that, that can be graded one, two, and three. Could you explain for the committee just the difference between the, the various grades? And could you also explain what, what the, the difference in the grades might have as far as socio and economic implications for, for that particular area of, of, uh, of rural Scotland might have? Um, I guess Alan and John probably would want to lead on that. Um, John, do you want to go first or do you want to let Alan lead on it? I was going to pass it to Alan, actually, but I'll okay. happy coming after. If I, start, if I start on a Scotland-wide basis, what, what, what's really happened is Marine Scotland Science have... Uh, have used what's called a sort of conservation limits approach, whereby they assess the, the likelihood that rivers are going to meet a, a, a target of eggs which are deposited into the rivers. And if they can meet that target, then, then there's an assessment that the river's relatively healthy. If they're less likely to meet it, then there's a sort of graded approach. Mm. So we have three grades of rivers. And in Scotland, depending on uh, what happens in committee, it was discussed in the, in the Environment Committee yesterday, um, the, the, the idea is that for 2018, 28 rivers would fall into, uh, into grade one, and that suggests that there's at least an 80% probability that the conservation limit will be met. 21 rivers will, will fall into grade two, and they sit somewhere between 60 and 80% probability of me meeting that conservation limit over a five-year five average. But 122 rivers fall into grade three, uh, mm. And that's with less than a 60% probability that the conservation limit will be met. And uh, in terms of the West Coast, that's the majority of the West Coast rivers in the aquaculture zone. Um, so that gives you, you an assessment. In terms of, the, in terms of the, the, the social and economic consequences of that, that tends to be quite river specific. Um, I, as a representative body for Boers and Trusts, I, I, I'm dealing with views that that range from going into a grade three river is, is a disaster, the anglers won't come, the angling clubs won't, won't fish and all the rest of it, to actually that's a good representation of the situation we're, that, that we're at and that gives us something to, to work from to get back up to a, a grade two river. So there are quite a range of views across that, across that, that, that spectrum. Mm. Um, 
Can you explain in, in what it means in practical terms if it's a grade one, two, Sorry, or three? Yes, and as far as the angler on the river is concerned, what yeah, does that so, mean? So, so the biggest practical difference is if you're a grade three river, it's mandatory 100% catch and release. So you're not allowed to kill and take home a fish. Mm. Um, so that's the biggest, uh, the biggest single. In the deputy convener on that, because I, I think she's got a question there. I do. Thank you. Good morning, panel. Um, John, you mentioned the, the co and the leaving and how the catches have substantially declined on both these rivers. Um, are they grade three already or are they going to be downgraded because of these catches? Interestingly enough, um, and very bizarrely, the, the river Leven, um, uh, I, I said before they didn't catch a single salmon. They actually caught a, a single pink Pacific salmon last year. Um, but due to the way the model works, they've actually been put to grade one this year. Um, so that's maybe something you'd have to ask Marine Scotland Science about the model. But um, the, the co has gone from a grade two to a grade three. But one thing I would say about all these gradings is, um, as Alan has said, it is the, the social impact of it um, is very river specific. But generally speaking, what I come across is a feeling, particularly amongst local anglers, who up and down the West Coast, um, with very, very few exceptions, have acted extremely responsibly for the best part of 20 years as we've seen these declines and put the vast majority of their fish back. I mean, well over 90%, 100% in some cases. Their feeling now to be forced to do that is a feeling of disenfranchisement you know they feel that they've been taken out of the equation and almost blamed for the decline and that there is a there's a poor local feeling about that which I think is is um, w perhaps avoidable and we need everyone to be you know um, moving in the same direction but um, does that answer your question uh, to a certain extent I have a couple of follow-ups now from your answer um, okay. do you have confidence that the grading system is adequate um, if you're asking for my personal opinion on that as a fishery manager, um, the answer is no. Um, I am encouraged that um, the model is being improved. It was brought in fairly quickly, but for the reasons that I've just mentioned, the, as someone who has to manage the, uh, the results of it, um, no, we, we, we don't feel it's a, a model that's currently fit for purpose. Okay, and just one final follow-up. Sorry, as we were talking about mortality rates in, in wild stocks, are there any mortality rates for catch and release? I think that's uh, Alan might be able to put some numbers on that, but I believe there are studies done on that. I think uh, okay. uh, Alan, before you do that, I'm going to let you just gather your thoughts because Guy wants to answer the previous question and then I'll come back to you. So, it, it was just to try and uh, help the committee in relation to the conservation limits and the various percentages and so on. We, we've uh, Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland, we've looked at the conservation limits and, and put them in graphical form. Um, so you can examine the East Coast, the, uh, the Clyde Solway area, and the aquaculture zone. And the graphical representation shows that the conservation limits, the probability of hitting your conservation limits is considerably lower in the aquaculture zone. Now what that suggests to, to us is that, yes, salmon populations are, are um, exposed to all sorts of other risks, climate change, um, habitat loss upstream, and so on, but there is something extra going on in the aquaculture zone that doesn't appear to be going on outside the aquaculture zone. So if I may, I'll supply that graph to the clerks after this. Yes, that'd be helpful. Uh, Alan, I'm going to come to you, and there's two questions, if you could also answer the socio-economic one as well, sorry. So uh, in terms of the grading system, I think from a fisheries management Scotland perspective, we, we support the principle of ensuring that exploitation is sustainable. And we've been working very hard with Marine Scotland Science to try and improve that, that model, along with a lot of the fisheries biologists across Scotland uh, over, over years. And that's an iterative uh, process, and we're, we're encouraged with the, the way that, that it's going. But, you know, I don't think anyone's arguing that the model is, is perfect. I would emphasise what, what, what John said, though, is that there is a, an absolute sense that we're... we're, we're Anglers and, uh, and proprietors are, are, are being looked at almost as, a, as an easy target here. We know that there are a range of pressures under, uh, that, that salmon are under. I don't think there's a, a strong sense that, that exploitation within fisheries is, is, is right up there in terms of those, uh, those range of pressures. So 
it's, it's right to have exploitation and, and ensure exploitation is sustainable, but on the same hand, we need to be dealing with all of the other pressures that salmon are under and, and, and deal with it in the round in a much, uh, much more um, um, rounded manner. In terms of catch and release, I think it's a while since, uh, since studies have been done. I think, again, it was discussed in committee yesterday at the Environment Committee. The sort of rule of thumb is around about 10%, but I understand that Marine Scotland are going to do maybe perhaps a bit more work on that this year. Peter, do you want to come in uh, just, again? Yeah, just one final bit. I mean, y y you've listed, you have 28 ones, 21 twos, and 122 graded three. What would that have looked like 20 years ago, for instance? I mean, it, we, we reckon it's, it's, it's going the wrong way. Uh, I mean, it's maybe an unfair question, but, you know, it, have you any idea how that's moved in the last even 10 or 15 uh, years? I mean, the, 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 the system's been in place for three years and it's shifted quite markedly Only in that years. time. All right. Um, because it works on, it, it, it's, it's driven uh, to, to, to a reasonable extent by catch. And because uh, we had a very, very good year in, in 2011 when we had, you know, very high catches across Scotland. Last year, the 2011 catches dropped out of the, 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 the five-year sort of uh, mm. average. So we, we, we've seen quite a marked, a marked drop um, on the back of that. But I wouldn't like to speculate about what it looked like 20 years ago, I'm no, afraid. I'm not sure. qualified to do that. John, I think you want to come in, and then we'll move on to the next question, which is Collins. Thank you. And just uh, given the foregoing discussion and the instrument that's under question uh, at yesterday's um, Environment Committee meeting, would you describe the science as sufficiently robust behind that new instrument? Uh, or should it proceed or shouldn't it proceed? Because there's certainly a lot of very unhappy people out there about the 122 uh, rivers that have now been categorised to grade three. And I'm far from certain, as Dr. Alan Wells has already said, that it's the, the catching of salmon that's um, to, to blame for that apparent decline in fish stocks, given the significant number of other challenges that they face. I, I could encourage you to do a yes or no answer. I won't push you quite that hard. Who'd like to head off on that? Um, John. Well, I'll simply, simply refer you to the answer I gave previously about the example of the River Leven. I don't believe that a model can be scientifically robust when it comes up with a grade one on a river that's caught zero salmon the year before. Uh, Alan. I think it's, it's quite a difficult one to answer when I represent so many different rivers across Scotland. But I think, as I say, I think the principle behind it is, is, is right. I think that there are concerns about the, the model and we, we're, we're working very hard to, to, to do them. And we're very encouraged with the changes that have been made to the model over time. Um, one of the problems that we've got in dealing with not just you know, the issues in relation to this, but in, uh, issues in relation to... Um, um, sea lice and, and, and issues along those lines is we lack the sort of infrastructure that they have in Norway. The reason that you can have more robust uh, information coming into these things is that other countries have large amounts of infrastructure such as fish counters whereby they can look at the catch statistics in relation to a fish counter on the same river and get a much better element of quality control. It's the same reason that we're able to do the sort of studies that have taken place in Norway on sea lice. It's, uh, it relates to the, the infrastructure that they have in place and that's the primary reason that that sort of research hasn't been done in Scotland. It's not, not necessarily because people haven't wanted to do it and all the rest of it. You need that infrastructure. Saying is that the, the the science hasn't been done to justify this massive recategorisation. Well, I think, as, uh, as Stuart Middlemas said in committee yesterday, that the general approach is very similar to the approach we all used share in that, Norway yes. and, uh, and England and, uh, and Ireland. Okay. Did you want to come in briefly on that? Yes. Um, the, in exactly the same way that the Eclair Committee called for a more precautionary approach to the aquaculture industry itself, I think it was absolutely right that the wild fishery sector should apply a precautionary approach to itself. And so if it means that more rivers get categorised such that there should be 100% catch and release on a precautionary basis while this model is developed, well, that's absolutely right, it would seem to me. Okay, so I think we'll just move on from there. And, and Colin, if, if you'd like to lead off on your questions. Thank, thank you, convener. Um, if I can return uh, to the vexed issue of, uh, of sea lice, um, and just to follow up um, a couple of points. I appreciate we've covered, we've covered the issue in um, quite a bit of detail so far, but there's a number of specifics. I mean, first of all, on the issue of trigger levels. Um, obviously, Marine Scotland um, 
have different levels from, 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 from guidance. And I just wondered if you believed that, that Marine Scotland had got the trigger levels um, for sea lice on fish farms correct? Are, are they the, 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 the levels that you believe they should be at? And is the action required once trigger levels have been reached uh, appropriate action? John, do you want to start off on that? Well, I'm sure everyone will um, want to comment on this, but briefly, um, on the subject of trigger levels or lice targets in general, um, I believe, and, and, and many people observing this have believed for many years that these numbers are essentially meaningless. If you have a lice target that doesn't take into account the number of fish in a fish farm or the biomass of fish in a fish farm or indeed on the path of a smolt from a river to the open ocean, then whether it's one, three, eight or whatever is essentially meaningless. So I'd just like to put that caveat in there before other people comment. Okay. Um, uh, Richard. Thank, thank you. Um, the trigger levels, uh, there are a number of trigger levels. There's the Salmon Farmers Code of Good Practice, which has trigger levels of 0.5 and 1 lice per fish at different times of year. And then there are the Marine Scotland trigger levels, which are supposed to trigger some kind of enforcement action. And these ones are all based on the impact on the farmed fish. So a farmed fish will suffer damage if it's carrying too many lice. Um, and if it's carrying a, a large burden of lice, it will die. So if you're measuring the number of lice per fish, basically what you're interested in is the um, impact on the farmed fish. Not, on their own, they say nothing about the impact on wild fish. As far as the wild fish are concerned, what is important is the number of lice larvae that are shed into the sea from a fish farm. So if you've got a fish farm with 100,000 fish in and one louse per fish, you know that it will be shedding a tenth of the amount of lice larvae into the sea of a farm with a million fish on it. So the correct measure, as John says, of the impact on wild fish is not the number of lice per fish, but the number of fish in the farm. Because given an equivalent lice loading, then the thing which determines the impact on wild fish is the, is the volume of fish in the farm. Guy, do you want to come, yes. come in? I'd cut you off earlier when you were talking That's about sea lice, so it must be your turn now. Um, in relation <clears throat> to the, the, the various trigger levels, um, notice that the Eclair Committee um, suggested that the 0.5 level in the Code of Good Practice should be a mandatory level. Um, and while the proviso, with the, all the provisos that lice per fish is not a good measure, it should be lice per farm, uh, as, as my colleagues have suggested, um, it would be sensible to put in a ceiling above which farms should not operate, should be required to, to harvest early to remove the fish. Um, Below that uh, level, depending on where the farm is, you need to apply some sort of adaptive management. And we heard a bit at the Eclair Committee about that approach, monitoring the wild fish, monitoring the lice impact on the wild fish, feeding back to how the farms operate. Um, but, but there does need to be a, a ceiling above which the farm should not operate. And, and the 0.5 trigger level would certainly be our preference. Alan. I would go slightly further than that. I mentioned earlier earlier on that we don't um, we don't deal with sea lice on a Scotland wide basis. We deal with it in a, on an area basis in what's called a farm management area. So I don't think we should be looking at this on an individual farm. I think we should be looking at this in a grouping of farms. The farm management areas are the areas in which fish are, are, are stocked synchronously. There is an element of, of synchronisation between the treatments and all the rest of it. So I think we need to think about it in terms of areas. There's actually quite a nice model for this. It's a voluntary model, but there's a, a new certification scheme that's been in place for a few years now called the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. And a lot of the principles that sit within that, that certification scheme would, I think, take this, the, the, this debate an awful lot further down the route. It's one of the main reasons why we're working much, much closer with Marine Harvest now, because they're the one company in Scotland that said they're going to try and get all of their farms through this uh, certification scheme. It requires a much lower uh, threshold for treatment of 0.1 lice per fish, 
but it also crucially takes into account the number of fish within the area. So it brings that overall area load into the equation as well. It requires monitoring of wild fish, so that sort of adaptive management that we talked about and that was recommended by the Environment Committee, uh, all as part of this, this system. So a lot of the principles that we would like to see sort of brought into the, the, the regulatory system actually already sit there. There's a, there's, a, there's a nice model for it sitting there within the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. Colin, do you want to To be clear, the, the, the information should be published. There should be a requirement on farms to publish certain information, and that information should be what, what sea lice um, per, per farm, and that should be a requirement. Is that pretty much what there's a consensus around? Yeah. Okay. Guy, I'm going to bring you in. Yes, I mean, we're completely happy with the, the recommendations of the Eclair Committee report that farm-specific sea lice data should be published on a, as close to a real-time uh, basis as possible. Um, this is something we raised in the, uh, the, the old RACI Committee prior to the 2013 Act, um, uh, and there was a lot of support for it then, and I think it, you know, the time is, for, is now, yes. And, and if you publish on a... Sorry, if you publish on a farm-by-farm -farm basis, then obviously you can you can uh, add that up to the farm management area, and if those farm management areas change, then you can take that into account as well. So. I noticed your enthusiasm, Alan. I was going to bring Richard in Sorry. first, so uh, Richard, now's your chance. Yes, I, I was going to point out that Marine Scotland themselves, in, in commenting on, on fish farm uh, planning applications, say that even if the farm adheres to the code of good practice level of one lice per fish, that provides no assurance that it will not have an impact on wild salmon populations or wild salmonid populations. So even Marine Scotland acknowledge that the, the code of good practice um, levels don't provide any protection necessarily against for wild fish. But the other thing I particularly would like to say was that um, two years ago, we were all talking about the code of good practice levels, 0.5 lice per fish and one lice per fish. Now we're all talking about these trigger levels for Marine Scotland, which have gone up to three lice per fish and eight lice per fish. And it's almost as if those have become targets. So whereas two years ago we were looking at levels of 0.5 and one lice per fish as being you know, where we ought to be, now we seem to be thinking, oh, well, as long as it's no more than three, then it's not too bad. You know, it's, there's a, a shifting baseline of, of aspiration, which is extremely worrying to me with these trigger levels. Stuart, you want to come in? Um, I just heard that we could work out what was happening in farm management areas by adding the figures for individual farms. Um, statistically, would that not be an invalid thing to do unless the dates at which each farm uh, reported was synchronised? Otherwise, you'd be adding numbers that were from different timeline points, which would not give you an understanding of uh, the farm management area. So therefore, is that implying that we need to have a coordination about reporting points for individual farms so that we can do those aggregations and comparisons? John, uh, Alan, just, John, you nodded there. I'd like to Sim bring you in. Simple answer is yes. I mean, there's, there's a strong case to um, synchronise the, the um, sampling and then also the, the manner in which the reporting is done to actually um, indicate the biomass and the areas. Um, but we are in, uh, very encouraged with the SSPO commitment to um, release farm-by-farm farm data by the end of April. Alan? It, it was just to say, at the moment, the farms, you know, uh, uh, assuming that the, the, there's not problems with the weather and all the rest of it, are counting lice on a weekly basis. If, if the requirement was to, uh, to publish on a, on a weekly basis and a farm basis, I think that deals with that issue. Colin, do you want to come back? Well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to turn just to, to, to what happens in other countries. I, I noticed in the, the evidence seeing Trout Conservation Scotland say that sea lice limits and enforcement are weaker in Scotland than other um, European salmon farming countries. So, so how do sea lice limits and enforcement work in other countries? Um, and are conditions in Scotland that different from other countries that we can effectively import some of the good practice there? Guy and then Alan. Well... Salmon farming in the Faroe Islands um, operates to a fairly rigorous scheme. They, they uh, require their farms to uh, report their lice figures when they exceed uh, 1.5, three, um, three consecutive reporting, so their fortnightly reporting. They have to harvest out their, their farms within two months. So it's, if you're 
three strikes and you're out. If you're over 1.5, three times in a row, the fish come out. And importantly, from the point of view of adaptive management, next time you stock your farm, you have to put fewer smolts in. So you, you're, you're, the following production cycle is at a lower level, and therefore, in theory at least, the lice issue should be addressed. And if it isn't addressed, then you go down further and so on. So the Eclair Committee talked about this adaptive management process that they want to apply. This is one of the, the ways they might seek to do it in this country. Alan, would you like to come in on that? I think I would just emphasise the sort of variability that we see across Scotland. I, I don't think it's it's remotely fair to say that there, you know, if there's a problem in one farm, there's necessarily a problem in another. There, it's a very complex system that we're all operating in here. Um, part of the problem is we don't actually fully understand the consequence of any particular lice level uh, in a particular location at a particular standing biomass of fish. Um, and it's very likely that will vary. And that, that's where the adaptive management, I think, is so crucial. If we can find a way of, of, of monitoring what's happening in the wild fish population in relation to what's happening on the farm, then we can tailor these approaches in an area-by-area -area basis rather than trying to have a one-size-fits-all one approach. Colin, do you want to add? Uh, uh, one, one thing, last week we heard from the uh, fisheries minister from Norway where they have actually lower targets than uh, that... that than we do in Scotland. And he was suggesting there was a traffic light system not dissimilar. Uh, have, have you, has anyone come across this system? Because it, it seemed to make, uh, it was a very interesting procedure where if, the, if you reach green level, you can stop more. And if you reach red level, you have to reduce input. So is, is, have any of you had come across that at all? Uh, Alan? I'm aware of the, the, the sort of broad principles of it, but not necessarily the, the specific detail. I think that is an example of adaptive management, but I don't think it's an example of adaptive management that using the specific thresholds that, 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 that they, they permit in Norway would necessarily work here. My understanding is that, the, they, that they would permit up to about 30% of the stock uh, of the wild stock to be impacted neg negatively before they go up to that sort of top level. I don't think our stocks on the West Coast are in a position to be able to withstand that sort of level. I mean, that's, that's certainly the difference between a grade two and a grade three and probably significantly more than that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Mike. Um, I'm going to focus on legislation and regulation to protect wild fish. Um, before I ask the question, I just want to, a very short quote from the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's recent report. And it said, the committee is not convinced SEPA or any other agency is effectively monitoring the environmental impact of salmon fisheries. The committee is also not convinced that the regulations, protocols and options for enforcement and prosecution for the sector are appropriate and being appropriately deployed. So my question is this, what legislation or regulations should be amended uh, in what way to, they should be amended to protect wild fish from any impact from salmon farming and which organisation should be responsible for regulating this? There quite, we go. Quite a lot of questions there. Um, Guy, I think you did. Yeah. The Salmon Trout Conservation Scotland petition from 2016 drew everyone's attention to the, the there is a gap in the law. There is no Scottish public authority charged with dealing with the interaction between farmed and wild fish. Um, and we're, we're pleased to see that the, the Eclair Committee, I hope I'm calling it the right name, but um, uh, accepts that and, and points to this gap in the law. Now, it can be plugged in a number of ways. Um, I've looked at it from the sort of purely legal point of view. You, you can amend the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007, you could amend the Marine Scotland Act uh, 2010, you could apply the Water Resource, uh, sorry, Water Environment and Water Services Act 2003 and introduce new car regulations under that. It, it all depends on what the government's policy decision is in relation to which regulator has to pick up this particular um, issue. Um, so there are a number of different ways of doing it, mm -hmm. um, all of which we'd be happy to help work with the government to, to, to deliver. Can I just say, it doesn't have to be the government. The committee can produce a committee bill, indeed. Well, indeed, indeed. Mm. Mm. Alan, would you like to comment on that? I think I would just emphasise what the, what the Environment Committee actually, uh, actually said and, 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 and agree with it. We have a situation at the moment where the Fish Health Inspectorate, for example, 
uh, as, a, as a remit for the health and welfare of the fish within the cages, but not for anything that comes out with the cages. We talked earlier about the number of fish within the cages. It's SEPA that are responsible for consenting that biomass, that number of fish which are actually in the cages, but they don't view sea lice and sea lice leaving the cages as part of their remit. So in terms of the specific legislation that needs to be, um, needs to be amended, I don't have a specific view on that. I think what we need to do is, is work out exactly where we want to be to, where, where we want to get to, sorry, and then look at the various pieces of legislation and decide what the, what the best way of doing that is. I was at a meeting a few weeks ago with the, the industry, with the local authorities who deal with the planning applications coming in and the various regulators, and that was a meeting that was hosted by the chief planner. And there was a very strong sense that um, the biggest outstanding issue that is not dealt with by the system at the moment is wild fish and, mm -hmm. and, and farm fish interactions. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been various reports that have been made. There was an independent consenting review a few years ago. There was various things. And basically, they've said, we'll take it out of the, 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 the Town and Country Planning Act and we'll shift it somewhere, somewhere else, perhaps a marine licensing system, which is the Marine Scotland Act that Guy, Guy mentioned. Um, but it's important to emphasize that just simply moving this issue from one system to another one doesn't deal with the underlying problem. We actually need to deal with the underlying problem and then the system works, work, works through it from that. Mm -hmm. um, from a slightly more local perspective on this, um, as we see the end results of regulation, um, currently, you know, as we know, uh, the um, it's with the planning committees of local authorities. I mean, um, usually the meeting to decide major developments um, of fish farms are done alongside house extensions and um, someone's garage or whatever. Um, seems rather odd to me. Um, and we can't expect the level of knowledge required to be sitting in these committees. I think it'd be completely unfair. And I think the Highland Council's response to the Eclair Committee um, hinted at that. Um, but I would also um, refer to the uh, comment in the Eclair Committee report that says there's too many regulators and not enough effective regulation. I have a certain sympathy with the fish farmers on this. Is What it's not saying is there's not enough regulation. There's not enough effective regulation. So it's clear that it needs to be streamlined in some way for, for everyone's interest. Um, but Alan's uh, referred to this, and it's actually referring back to a point earlier on on sea lice, is SEPA fundamentally decide on how many fish go into a cage or how many fish are going to be allowed in that cage. So I would argue, therefore, by default, they are actually um, uh, overseeing sea lice. Um, they maintain they're not, but I think that needs to be clarified. I would argue that they actually are. It's a hot potato that's been passed around for many, many years, but it, it needs to find a, a home, and so, um, a, a one organisation needs to have broad enough shoulders to take it on. Mike, do you want to... Yes, uh, on that very point, I mean... Do you think that the responsibility should be SEPA's uh, and therefore I mean, they're, often, they're being particularly criticised by the Environment Committee? Um, do we need to change the law and change the regulations to give SEPA the proper responsibility for regulating this whole issue? I don't, or, or, I mean, there is a view that perhaps another uh, organisation should be set up, but if, if, if people are saying there's too many regulators and not enough regulation, effective regulation, is the solution to make sure that SEPA gets the proper instruction to do it? Um, Richard, uh, Guy, and then I'll come back to you, John, if I may, and, and Richard Lyle afterwards. Um, so, Richard first. Thank you. Um, yes, the, the, the problem is, at the moment, that we've got three regulators, all of whom deny it's anything to do with them. It's a very unedifying spectacle of everyone taking a collective step backwards and scrambling for the exit. Um, and SEPA argue that it's not a pollutant, so it's nothing to do with them. And marine fish health inspectorates say they're interested in farmed fish and the local authorities are more interested in garages. As, so, I mean... And we, I mean, I've got a letter from SEPA dealing with this exact point, and it says SEPA acknowledges that sea lice and escapes of farmed stocks are pressures on the water environment. For these pressures, however, Marine Scotland and the local authorities are the principal bodies for regulating existing and new aquaculture developments. In other words, it's nothing to do with us. Um, and that's, as John says, it's not the case, because the primary uh, 
lever by which you could control sea lice escapes is by limiting the volume of fish in fish farms or the number of fish in an individual fish farm. And we've just been looking at this um, new um, consultation on the um, depositional zone regulations. And the preamble to that says that the main uh, purpose of this, or one of the main outcomes of this, will be able to increase the volume of fish farms from 2,500 tonnes to 8,000 tonnes. So here we have an existing problem with fish farms, which are, at the moment don't exceed 2,500 tonnes. And CEPA is talking about increasing that by many times with absolutely no um, consideration of what impact that might have on wild fish, because we've already seen CEPA are saying it's nothing to do with us. But CEPA are the main body which is limiting the, vo the size of individual fish farms, and that is the main um, uh, source of pressure on wild fish populations. Therefore, is what you're saying, should we as a parliament give, give CEPA the clear responsibility to regulate this? Well, I think the, the, the problem is that there are, the way fish farms operate at the moment, and if you're applying for a new fish farm, you've got to get two things. You've got to get, um, well, you've got to get your Crown Estate lease, but the two principally regulatory steps you've got to, hoops you've got to jump through. Um, the first is you've got to get your car license to discharge pollutants. And the second is you've got to get your planning consent. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the fish farms as to which of those they go for first. And they tend to play one off against the other. So they'll get their car license and then go along to the local authority and say, we've got our car license, so CEPA think it's OK, so it's up to you now. Um, and uh, it's, as I say, that there is this sort of feeling that you're playing one off against the other and nobody wants to be seen to be standing in the way of a new fish farm if somebody else has already p approved it. So I think it, uh, really what is needed is a single streamlined process whereby you make a single application for the fish farm and all of the impacts are considered together um, rather than trying to split it up into two processes. Guy, I'd like to bring you in and then John. Yeah, I, I'd like to endorse everything that Rich just said, but perhaps as a little bit of history, if you go back to the SEPA's fish farm manual from 2005, so prior to the Agriculture Fisheries Act 2007, they did state that they would limit the biomass on fish farms in order to protect important stocks of wild salmonids. They, yeah, that's in the fish farm manual from 2005. What I think happened in 2007, when the sea lice powers were given to the Fish Health Inspectorate, SEPA thought, ah, that's not us anymore then. But without appreciating that the powers that the Fish Health Inspectorate were given in the 2007 Act related just to the farmed fish and not to the, the farm fish, wild fish interaction. So I think that's where the problem arose. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to get back because the, the institutional memory within SEPA is not great. But um, it, it's, I think it's perfectly possible that SEPA could take this role. I think you also look at their the responsibilities under the Water Framework Directive and the fish element within categorising um, the status of water bodies under that directive, and it would fit quite neatly with what they already have to do. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the Water Environment and Water Services Act 2003 is already set up to allow uh, regulations to be drawn. There's no reason why regulations couldn't be drawn under that Act to firmly place this uh, in the responsibility of SEPA. It wouldn't require primary legislation. Come to John, and then I'm going to go to Richard Lyle and come to you, Alan Wells. So, John. Again, yes, um, I would just back up what um, the other witnesses have said on this matter. But I would also add, um, Richard's mentioned the two um, uh, processes you have to go through if you want to you know, have a new fish farm. Um, but there is actually a third one, um, and it's actually before any of those take place. And uh, as a fish farmer, I, I have to apply for one, and I've got one, which is an APB license, which is an Aquaculture Production Business License. It's essentially a, a license to operate, and it's issued by Marine Scotland. Um, now, there's possibly a, a, um, a possibility there you could use that licensing system to address some of these issues. And we would certainly like to see in terms of the planning applications and the car applications for fish farms, like to see Marine Scotland take a far more, uh, of a far stronger view than they're currently doing. Um, and because currently they're, they're, they're fairly neutral in their response because they are actually just acting as a statutory consultee, exactly the same as the fishery boards. Whereas I would argue um, Marine Scotland perhaps um, as 
or SEPA, perhaps, best place to take this on. Okay. Richard Lyle, do you want to come in with it? Yeah, well, basically, I agree. I think we should make someone in charge. But last week, I asked, can I say, gentlemen, you've vindicated the point I made last week. That I thought there were too many fish in, in, the, in, 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 in the farm. And, and, but I was told, oh, the more the merrier, because they're all happy. You know, if they're, if they're swimming about in big shoals. So, thank you very much. You've just confirmed what I said, and I think that's the other point we should be looking at. Thank you. Yeah. So, we, we've got the more fish, the happier the fish. Uh, um, Mike, do you want to... to I, I, just correct me if I'm wrong. I'm getting from you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm getting from you that we actually think it should be stronger regulation, and it should be someone in charge of that regulation, and it would be more likely than not to be SEPA. Is that right? Most people are nodding and, and, and shrugging their shoulders at the end. I'm going to bring in Alan, then I'll bring in John Finney. Alan. I, I don't have a strong view about who should lead. I think someone should lead, but I think what's really important is that the current regulatory lacunas, which I think lots of people understand, whereby wild fish seem to fall through all the gaps, desperately needs to be addressed. John. Would you like to come in with a brief supplementary? Uh, thank you, Convener. Morning, panel. I'm just trying to clarify, are you all seeing no role for the local authority in the process? Uh, Guy. Um, with another hat on, I, I've acted for, for groups on the West Coast uh, looking at fish farm applications, and, and it's not just wild fish interactions they're concerned about. Local communities have concerns over landscape, over navigation issues, over all sorts of things. There, there has to be some element of local accountability. It would be untenable, I would say, to, to remove responsibility completely from those authorities on the West Coast and place it in Edinburgh. Uh, I just don't think that would work. So I, I would definitely see a role for local authorities going forward. I, I could go right the way down the line, but maybe for the official record, if I say that you're all nodding, that, that, that local uh, people and local authorities should have a role. Are you happy with that, John? That's helpful. Thank you very much. Okay. Can we move on to the next question, which is uh, Gail Ross? Thank you, Convener. Um, marine protected areas. There are various communities along the West Coast that are very nervous about new applications or existing farms extending, should they be allowed in marine protected areas? Who'd like to head off Richard? Um, <clears throat> thank you. Marine protected areas have, are being, have been designated for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, there are protected areas for harbour porpoises, there are protected areas for flapper skates, there are protected areas for um, different habitat types like burrowed mud habitat. Now, all of those features are impacted to different extents by fish farming. And clearly, um, the measures you would put in place for a harbour porpoise would not be the same as the measures you'd put in place for burrowed mud because the impacts would be very different. So I think um, one wouldn't want to say that there shouldn't be any um, um, fish farms in marine protected areas because it would, you'd need to know what the particular impacts were. Having said that, um, the, when the um, marine protected areas were originally drawn up, the boundaries of these, um, Marine Scotland looked at a range of priority marine features. I think there were something like 80 different marine, priority marine features and they were um, individual marine protected areas were drawn up, established to protect a certain list of priority marine features. Now, some of those priority marine features have no marine protected areas at all. So, for instance, the um, sea trout, which we've been talking about a lot, is a priority marine feature in the Atlantic salmon, but there are no marine protected areas set up to protect those. Now, clearly, if you'd set up a marine protected area to um, protect the sea trout, then it would be perfectly reasonable to say, well, we don't actually think we would not want any um, uh, fish farms in here because of the problems of interaction of um, sea lice with the wild sea trout. Um, and the government announced that um, these other priority marine features would be protected by a range of wider seas issues. Now, I'm afraid I don't see a lot of evidence of that at the moment, certainly in relation to fish farms. Um, uh, the panel may be aware that there was a problem a few years ago um, with um, damage to flame shell beds outside marine protected areas in Loch Carron. 
um, from this was from um, trawling activity, dredging activity. Um, so even if you have all of your features within the marine protected areas adequately protected, there will still be damage out with those areas to some of these features, some of which are extremely important. Um, yeah, I, I know the um, example that you're talking about. And a marine protected area was then set up to protect that um, bed. Sorry, I, I know that Alan wants to come in, but just um, we were talking about regulation um, earlier on. Do you think there are any regulations that need to change to take into account priority marine features or, or MPAs? Um, marine Scotland are currently carrying out a review of some of these priority marine features. I think there are 11 of them which are particularly susceptible. This is to fishing pressures um, to see um, whether other protection measures are needed. Um, so, but I don't think there's been, I think, a review of the features that are particularly um, impacted by or likely to be impacted by aquaculture. It would be a good idea to carry out a review of those features because that hasn't happened up until now. And the, um, the assessment of the impacts on some of those features really is, is not, in my view, adequate at the moment. Alan, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, the, I've already mentioned that the Atlantic salmon and sea trout are prior to marine features, but they're not part of the sort of area protection element. So it's slightly out, out, out with my locus. Uh, but some of my members are particularly interested in, from a nature conservation perspective, freshwater pearl mussels, which are um, critically endangered. And uh, they rely on salmon and sea trout to complete their life cycle. So the migrating fish coming back into the river pick up the larvae of the, 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 the freshwater pearl mussel, move them back up the river. And that emphasises how important sea trout are, because some of the SACs for freshwater pearl mussel on the West Coast are primarily sea trout rivers rather than Atlantic salmon rivers. So sea trout need to be looked at, not just in terms of their, their value from a fishery and a nature conservation perspective in their own right, but also with the linkage to these other, as I say, critically, critically endangered species. John, do you want to come in at this stage? Because I know Gail's got further questions here. Oh, it was just about um, the protection of, of marl beds and... Um, fish farms being located over them and um, the clear committee received um, some evidence to say that that hasn't always been all that it might be would you like to discuss that Richard would you, you like to know about it um, well marl beds are particularly susceptible to damage from um, uh, sedimentation of organic material from fish farms um, and there's been various studies to indicate that um, where you get um, mole beds in proximity to, to fish farms, you can see evidence of sedimentation at some considerable distance from the fish farm. So um, mole beds are also under threat from a number of other things, such as dredging, but um, fish farms would be an additional uh, pressure on mole beds that um, needs to be addressed. Now, obviously, when those fish farms, most of the fish farms were set up, there was no protection for those mill beds. The fish farms have been there for some considerable length of time. In fact, of the 220 odd active salmon farms in Scotland, in the sea, um, something like over 30% of those are already in protected areas. Now, so the fish farm was in operation before the protected area was um, delineated. Now, um, I think there's, there's a sort of assumption that if, um, if fish farming has been going on before this thing was dis um, designated as a marine protected area, then it can't have been doing much damage. Well, I, I don't think that's a safe assumption. I think we really do need to look at some of the impacts of these fish farms. Um, and that's just in terms of gross pollution of, of, of feces and other organic material. But when you look at some of the um, chemicals, we haven't even really started about talking about some of these therapeutic chemicals which are used in fish farms, which we're now getting evidence um, are having much wider, uh, more widespread effects, you know, kilometres from the fish farm. I think we do need to look much more closely at the impacts of some of the existing fish farms within um, marine protected areas. Which is a perfect opportunity to bring the deputy convener back in. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, I want to um, just ask a question on depositional zone regulations. Um, CEPA are currently, well, they've just closed a consultation. I think their um, results are going to come to us in June this year. Um, but the Eclair Committee said that, uh, and I quote, they understand the new DZR that has been consulted on seems to allow the expansion of fish farms in more exposed locations while requiring a tightening of the monitoring of nutrient waste. But they say that this has not been peer reviewed and there's a lack of available scientific and published evidence to support the model. I also asked about um, communities and, and their um, concerns about fish farms close to the coast. So we have the um, uh, kind of conflicting of do we put them further out to see where they're more exposed and therefore coastal communities are happier? But are there problems with them being more exposed in the depositional zone regulations? Do you have uh, an opinion on that? Richard. Um, I, I've already highlighted one major concern with the depositional zone regulations in the fact that um, increasing the size of a fish farm is um, going to make the sea lice issue considerably worse. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be any consideration of that in, in, the, in the mechanism as it stands at the moment. Um, the dispersion of waste from fish farms is a, is a very complex subject. But I think the thing that you need to bear in mind is that within the aquaculture zone, that's the, the, the West Coast, 80% of all of the organic waste from terrestrial sources from the land enters the sea comes from fish farms. A single fish farm, which are currently has a maximum size at the moment of um, 2,500 tonnes, produces the sewage equivalent of a town twice the size of Oban. So if you take, add up all of the towns on the west coast virtually, it's producing the same amount of sewage as one fish farm a moderately large sized fish farm. Now, of course, you're not allowed to discharge waste from a single septic tank into the sea without being treated. And if you were to suggest building two ovens somewhere in the sand of Mull and saying, is it all right if we just chuck the sewage straight in the sea, you'd get a very sh short shrift from SEPA over it. But somehow, um, putting a new fish farm in seems to be exempt from a lot of these issues. So we, we are talking about huge quantities of organic waste being put into the sea. Now, um, there have been various um, attempts to improve the modelling. There's been this deeper mod model that SEPA used for predicting um, the impact of um, the dispersion of waste from fish farms has gone through a number of different iterations and there was the phase one version and the phase two version. And none of them are particularly good at modelling complex currents if you've got a, a complex environment with different sea locks coming in and islands and tidal currents going in all directions, then um, you have extremely complex currents. Now, I was at a presentation from SEPA just last week when they were demonstrating the use of yet another model, which actually, um, uh, far beyond the one they're talking about, um, deeper mod for the, the use of um, these DZR regulations, which was showing much um, more complex interactions between all of these currents and that you were getting deposition in areas very remote from w the fish farm. So you'd be getting you know, deposition two or three kilometres away from a fish farm, whereas the current models assume that all of the impact is within a single one kilometre square or maybe slightly larger now. Um, and once the waste leaves that modelled square, they forget about it completely. Uh, in fact, we know that's not the case. Some of that model, the, some of that waste is channeled into very specific locations and deposited there, quite a long way from fish farms. And, and none of these models at the moment really capture that. And I think the DZR model, which is based on a, a, another iteration of this deeper mod, will have exactly the same problems. John, I'd like to bring you in there. I appreciate the, the, the question is specifically about DZR, but if I may make some general comments about these uh, newer, higher energy sites, um, specifically the ones close to us in my region are, are Rum and Muck and the, the, the Inner Isles. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that the general direction of travel within the fish farming industry is looking towards these new sites. 
But certainly from our perspective, there's one key uh, piece of the jigsaw missing prior to this, and that's actually working out where the smolts from the rivers on the west coast of Scotland, what are their migration paths? Now, if that was done as a pre-application um, uh, piece of work, then we may well find from that that on the issue of sea lice, um, there may well be parts of the inner isles or elsewhere in these high energy sites that actually impact uh, migrating fish far less than other sites. Now, if we knew that, that might well offer an incentive for the industry to, to meet expansion targets, but it would also satisfy a great deal of wild fish concerns. But at the moment, what happens is, if you want to build a fish farm in Inner Isles, um, you get the, the, the usual authorities allowing it, and there's no pre-application work at all. And so we don't actually know what we're putting out there. In general, we would far prefer to see the relocation of inshore sites out to these sites, but we need to have that work done before. And if I may just uh, also add that um, at the moment, um, there is no mechanism within the regulation to allow the local authority to allow any relocation of inshore sites. So often as a fishery board, as a statutory consultee, we'll reply to these applications and say, yes, we're conditionally supportive of these sites. We'd like to see smolt migration work done before you go in there. But secondly, we'd like to see a phased relocation of particularly sensitive sites. Now, at the moment, the local authority has no power to um, say to a, a, a site inshore already with a full planning permission, um, you have to relocate biomass. So what I would suggest is we need some, some sort of mechanism within the planning regulations to allow that. And I think we, we might be perhaps even knocking at an open door within some of the fish farm companies on that. Um, there's people queuing up to speak here and um, 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 time is marching on. So. Alan and uh, I'll take Alan and then Guy, and I, I, I would ask you to keep it very brief. Guy, if you're going to drop out, I'll bring Stuart in after Alan very briefly. Just, Alan. Just very, just very quickly, uh, for all the reasons that we discussed in the earlier part of the, 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 the session about regulation, we're of the view that the DZ, DZR proposals as they stand shouldn't be taken forward in isolation from a broader review of regulation more generally. Um, I think most of the, the issues have been covered, but there's one thing in DZR that I think is a good principle, and that is that CEPA is saying that they would intend to take on a greater responsibility for monitoring and requiring, a, uh, f for actually monitoring themselves rather than operator monitoring. And I think that principle is a good principle within the DZR uh, um, um, proposals. Sorry, the regulations that the proposal should not be taken forward, it should be as a. That was part what, of that was what we said in regulation. our consultation okay, response. Okay, thank you. Stuart, do you want to come in very briefly? Um, Before I move on to John. I'm just on the arithmetic again. Um, th in relation to a large fish farm putting the same amount of waste out as Oban, I just wonder the natural biomass that there is in a particular area will also be putting waste material in. So I, I, my question is, is it known by what proportion the natural biomass is increased by the presence of fish farms. Now, I'm not asking the question about local effects, because clearly if you put the biomass in one place, you get it all in one place. I'm just asking a more general question. Uh, Richard, I'll bring you in, and then we must move on to the next question, I'm afraid. So, Richard. Um, I think the answer to that question is probably not the natural biomass. We've got to bear in mind that this is an intensive farming operation. Yes, yes. So if you were to talk about the natural density of large mammals in the, the highlands, it would be a certain area, but a certain number of kilos per hectare or something. But if you put in an intensive cattle farm, then it's a very much greater um, density of, of animals per unit area. And, and that's exactly the case with a fish farm. Not only are you putting in a very high density of fish, but you're also chucking in large quantities of fish meal and food, which has come from all over the place, which is an, a, a net input to that ecosystem. So it's inevitably going to have a large effect. But it's there for the density rather than the volume that we are speaking about. And I understand that point. I think the community would now wish me to shut up. Uh, I'm not even going to go there with an answer to that. John, um, perhaps you'd like to move on to the next question. Oh, thank you, uh, convener. And I want to talk about uh, the problem of escapees of, of farm fish and 
and the problems as you see them uh, for the record. Uh, we're probably all familiar with them to some extent. I'm intrigued to read um, that in Norway it is a notable escape Bees of farm fish are considered to be the greatest threat to wild salmon. And further, that we understand that in Norway, if farm fish escape, the onus is on the fish farm to catch those escaped fish, incurring the cost of doing so themselves. Now, that would be groundbreaking. Discuss. We'd like to head off to Alan. I think there's a, there's a, a few elements of the regulatory system in Scotland which are, are, are interesting in relation to this. In Scotland, it's not an offence to have an escape. It's only an offence not to report it if you have one or to report um, circumstances that may have led to an escape. So even if you don't know if there's an escape, so if you find a hole in the net, you have to report that even though you don't know whether fish have uh, um, um, escaped or not. Now, there's obviously escapes do happen in Scotland. And in particular, we're, we're concerned about uh, escapes that have happened in, in freshwater as well. And we have a situation on a, on a particular freshwater loch in Scotland, Loch Shin, where there are two farms. And for a long time, farmed fish have been found in the, in the loch. But because there's two farms and there have been no reported escapes, both farms have said, well, it's not as we, ha we haven't got any sign of an escape. Recently, Marine Scotland Science has, has demonstrated through genetic analysis of those fish that actually those escapes have been coming from both fish. There haven't been any reported escapes, but, but for whatever reason, these fish have been getting out into the loch. And uh, there are all sorts of concerns around that. Concerns relate to genetic integration, the genes from the farm fish uh, getting into the wild population through, through, through crossbreeding. But even if that doesn't happen, if you have large numbers of escapes, uh, it can swamp the wild population. Generally speaking, um, um, the, uh, see the, the, the loss that we have in Scotland are, are quite nutrient poor. There's not a huge amount of habitat, so the numbers are relatively low. If you have large numbers of farm fish coming into those areas, that can cause problems. <coughs> Equally, if you have escapes in the, in the marine environment, if they do find their way into the river, again, they can, they can uh, crossbreed with wild fish. And we know that fish which have uh, crossbred are much less uh, um, um, able to survive in future. In terms of your answer and the answers of others, would you like to propose solutions as well as you go along, as well as defining the problem we're interested in solutions? Would you like to come in there? Certainly. Um, and just to refer back to the, the freshwater farm issue, and as you say, to actually say what is the solution to this, because I would um, certainly back up what Alan said about the problem. We have uh, two very large, um, sorry, three very large freshwater smolt farms in our region. And we get, you may have heard this term drip, drip, escape. Um, as a grower of juvenile fish, I know that they're not always the same size. So if you put those in a net pen, they're not always going to be held by that net pen. They do escape. We've had two burns that, uh, that have shown 100% Norwegian gene in all the juveniles in the, in the spawning burns. Um, it's probably the reason that this practice of open cage farming uh, in freshwater locks is not allowed in Norway, but it is in Scotland. So solution, I think the solution I would say is fairly straightforward for the freshwater farms. Indeed, the farmers have already addressed this and they're now growing smolts in uh, closed containment units, uh, specifically I think of marine harvest at Loch Islet and, and also at Inchmore, very large closed containment smolt growing units. Um, so there is a solution to it and it's already tried, tested and very much up and running. Just, just to add a bit of clarity, um, these uh, juvenile fish that are in fresh water, if they escape, do they have to go through the same process of going to sea for maturity or can they actually go into the burns and, and become sexually mature without going to sea? I mean, I think well, somebody said that that is possible. Is that possible? It's um, absolutely possible, uh, particularly for the male fish. You get what, what, what's called a precocious par, which is a very odd term, but what that means is a, is a, is a par, so a small juvenile fish that matures in fresh water. Um, but um, there's a lot of work being done to show that actually these precocious par can actually make a large contribution uh, to the spawning effort. Um, so it doesn't just take um, you know, large male Atlantic salmon returning from sea. So therefore, that genetic can get into the wild population very quickly. OK, thank you. Uh, would it, Richard, would you like to comment on that? And then I'll come back to you, John. Um, well, no, just, just to say that, um, as, as, as you already highlighted, it's the number one threat in, in Norway. And, and the, the main problem is that um, these um, escaped fish show lower survival levels once they get into the into the 
wild into the sea or, and the rivers. Um, and it doesn't take a very large change in, in the survival rate to have a major impact on, on the number of fish returning to the river at the end of the day. Could we be pursuing the same, um, with the same vigour, the way that the Norwegians are, are pursuing these escapees, um, that it's up to the, the farm fish from whence they came, uh, the farm, to, to catch them and recapture them? Or, um, and does that lead to things like tagging or I mean, I think it, there's satellites out there now? Well, as, as Alan says, genetic fingerprinting can identify the source of the fish quite well but in many cases. You know where the fish is and go and catch but, it. Uh, it. Really, I mean, uh, once the fish have got out into the environment, it's quite difficult to catch them all. In fact, it's extremely difficult to catch them or it's impossible to catch them all. So um, really the, the problem is to stop them getting out in the first place. And as some, several people have said, the answer to most of these things is closed containment. If you've got closed containment, that's... Um, solves an awful lot of these big problems we're talking about. Guy, I'm going to bring you in and then John, and, and, and John, I'm afraid we'll then have to move on to the next question. Yes, so I was merely going to say what Rich has just said, that it, the answer to this is not to let the fish out in the first place, and that is to grow them in closed containment. You won't stop all escapes. Closed containment will have accidents, but it'll be far reduced from where we are now. John, do you want to, to... Very briefly, one other point on, on escapes is we find locally that uh, farm fish don't tend to run into rivers immediately. They tend to mill around in the sea locks for really quite a long time. And then we've got to think of what are the knock-on effects of that. And, and uh, we suggest that actually the, the predation levels you get, particularly from common seals, the common seal population is doing very well in the West, and it may well be because of the level of escaped fish around. Certainly nets that we still lift the odd illegal net around the coastline of the West, as one might expect. Um, it's in the culture. But mostly what we find in those nets is farm fish. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Finney, yours is the next um, question. Thank you, Convener. I had a couple of questions. I think you'll yes. appreciate yep. that one of them has been comprehensively answered. We were going to draw on the evidence that you referred to in your written evidence, Mr Gibb, about freshwater uh, fish. Just um, as, as an interim step or as a general, you talk about closed containment rather than a, a limit to the number or the density. Um, should that be a factor at the moment? Uh, Bo both in freshwater and in seawater? To cover the freshwater, um, my own view would be it's a bit of an all or nothing. I don't think it makes a great deal of difference to us uh, what the <laughs> total amount of fish is in the farm. Really, the issues of those escapes and, and the issue of excess feed falling down uh, from the nets and then that sort of having an impact on, on growing species below, wild species below the nets sea trout that want to go to sea. The only reason the sea trout goes to sea is to find food. If it comes across that food on its migration path to the sea, um, there's every likelihood, and certainly um, evidence would suggest this, that they're simply reverting to, to resident brown trout. Uh, we're catching resident brown trout in Loch Lochy, where there's the largest uh, freshwater smolt farm in Scotland, um, of up to 23 pounds for a resident brown trout in Scotland. A, a good resident brown trout pre-fish farming days was probably two pounds. So we're getting these enormous fish, which obviously um, smolts, salmon and sea trout are funneled on their way to sea at the exits of these lochs. And you can actually visually see sometimes at dams or whatever, these huge trout just picking off the smolts. So there's knock-on effects. But I don't think it's about numbers for freshwater. Seawater, sea um, I'm sure the others will, will want to comment on that. Okay, I mean, we did, we did not to labour the point, we did hear last week about how fish concentrate together anyway, regardless of the space they got. Is it a question of density then in some instances? Should there be a limit to the, the density of fish? I'm trying to use a layperson's term here. Um, do you want to come on? Just to clarify, from a wild fish perspective, the density in which the, the, the fish are farmed is much more of a, a, a welfare issue for the, for, the fish, for the fish in the cages. When we're talking about escapes, it's, it's, it's when the fish get out. That I, yeah. I'm not sure to what extent the density of fish within the cages is, ha, has a bearing on that. Okay, thank you. The, the, the other question I'd like to ask uh, relates to medicines and chemicals, and there's been a, a lot, you're all familiar with the, the Clare Committee's report, and they, they, they talked about specifically data analysis and analysis gaps, including the analysis of the cumulative or uh, additive effects. Um, now, it's, I mean, obviously, we know that uh, medicines and chemicals are used to treat farm sal salmon with sea lice. Do you, could you comment on the impact these treatments have on the environment or other species? 
and I think we've covered the point, but just to, to perhaps labour it, and do you believe that issue is effectively regulated, please? Richard, please. Yeah. Um, <coughs> you're right to highlight this. Um, there are a whole range of problems. One of the um, best documented studies, I think, is of um, one of the in-feed treatments, hemomectin benzoate, um, of which there was a, a study carried out by the Scottish Association for Marine Science a few years ago, which concluded that um, levels of um, residues from this, this chemical were much higher than, well, higher than expected, but also that it was causing mortality, widespread mortality of wild crustaceans at very low levels, in levels below the level at which you could detect them in the water column or in the sediment. Now, this chemical, emomectin benzoate, has a half-life of 250 days in the, once it gets into the sediment, so half of it will have disappeared after about nine months or whatever it is. Um, the European Medicines Directive defines a very persistent biotoxin as one which has a half-life of 180 days, so this is a nasty chemical which is being chucked into the sea in, in large quantities and which is impacting wild crustaceans, um, as far as we know, at extremely low levels, um, causing mortality of 60 to 90 percent of wild populations of some of these crustaceans. Um, and so clearly that's not being adequately regulated at the moment. And there are discuss ongoing discussions about whether we need to radically reduce the environmental standards for this for this chemical or sorry the amount which can be um, put into the environment but there are a number of other chemicals which are used which um, are not regulated at all for instance we were talking about gill diseases earlier one of the main chemicals which is used to trust drunk treat gill diseases is hydrogen peroxide and there are virtually no controls at all on hydrogen peroxide it's a very um, um, strong oxidizing agent and it kills off quite a lot of organisms in the sea but there are virtually no controls on the release of this chemical into the sea and it's being used in increasing quantities because of the increasing incidence of these diseases. Um, some of the other chemicals are, are neurotoxins which are um, neurotoxins are in the news a bit at the moment but these things are being used in bath treatments which is um, contain the pen temporarily, pour the chemicals in, and then when the <coughs> treatment's over, you just take the containment off and this chemical gets released into the sea. Now, we um, know that the plumes from those um, um, bath treatments can extend five, four or five kilometres away from the, can be detectable four or five kilometres away. Now, what the impacts of those are, um, I'm sure they'll be, um, we don't know fully, but they wouldn't be surprised if some of them were, were much more extensive than, than we currently understand. Uh, um, so uh, there is a lot of concerns relating to s many of these chemicals which are used. Thank you. I mean, I noticed most of you nodding there. Does anyone want to come in? Or jo John, have you got a follow-up to that? Or? Yeah, that's, that's well, thank you. Thank you. I, I think then, if no one's got a follow-up, uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next question, which is Stuart Stevenson. Um, I've been encouraged to ask about partnership, but I think it's probably been adequately covered, uh, convener. So uh, the, that leaves me just with the question uh, that there are ways of engineering better solutions, uh, funnels beneath sa salmon farms, closed containment we've talked about. Uh, but my question is simply, are there sufficient incentives, uh, regulatory or economic, uh, to cause the ad adoption of this in uh, the farm industry. I'm, I'm going to come to John first as, uh, as a declared fish farmer. Well, I, I think the incentive um, probably in all of this is to identify a site for a fish farm company where it can operate um, uh, without uh, risk to the environment and some of the things that we've already covered be that the monitoring of oh, smolt movements, good. these higher energy sites, DZR coming into play, there might be, well be that incentive there but um, I don't believe there's a great deal of incentive for inshore sites nor perhaps should there be uh, based on what we know. Uh, Alan. Um, 
I, there are not any incentives that, I, that I'm aware of, but I, I know that the situation in Norway does incentivise some of these, uh, these technologies, and, and certainly in our response to the, the Environment Committee, we, we made the point that it would be good to see those sort of in, uh, incentives coming through in Scotland. Yeah. Possible for this committee, what incentives uh, matter in Norway that would help you? So I, I, I don't know the specific details, but they have a green license system whereby you can get a reduction in your license fees if you if you're trialling new technologies, whether it's closed containment, whether it's some other form of of, of dealing with sea lice or, or, or other challenges. So it, it it comes through the licensing system in Norway. It's not necessarily a direct parallel, but the point point I'm making is if there's a way of incentivising this sort of this sort of thing in Scotland, then I think we should look at it. Richard, and then Guy. Yeah, um, a lot of these um, new technologies, such as closed containment, are um, one of the main arguments against them is because they're more expensive to operate and therefore it's more difficult to run a farm at a profit. So um, some kind of financial incentive, I, I believe for this green technology incentive that Alan was mentioning, you get a 90% discount on your license fee, and the license fees are quite high. So that sort of level of discount is, is going to produce some effects. But ultimately, the, the, the issue is that um, salmon farms at the moment externalize a lot of their costs. So I was talking about you know, the issue of discharging sewage into the sea. If you've got a, a sewage plant on land or a, a farm intensive cattle dig on land, you have to pay for the treatment or, or disposal of, of that waste. Well, fish farms externalise those costs, they chuck it into the sea, and they don't have to pay for it. It's a free service they get. And similarly, the disposal of these chemicals that um, are being discharged into the sea through um, either from release from bath treatments or in, in feed treatments, that's a free disposal service. <laughs> now, if you um, have chemical residues um, resulting from your farming operation, then you do need to dispose of those appropriately. So all of these, all of these um, costs are, are currently externalised, and, and we've said that closed containment is a is um, a new technology and, and something which um, is more expensive. But actually, effectively, what you're doing is trying to bring some of those costs into the economic envelope of the farm and, and, and get them properly dealt with. So I think the sooner we can move in that direction, the better. Guy. Um, just to add to what Richard's saying, you, you need as many incentives as you, as you can possibly give closed containment. Um, one of the options the Scottish Government has before it is, is in relation to seabed leases. Now the Crown Estate has devolved up here. There is no reason why a Crown Estate lease for, for a novel site shouldn't come at a peppercorn. Um, Moving forward, if you're going to incentivise closed containment, you also need to address the externalities issue that Richard talked about. And, and the, the licence fees for open cage traditional fish farms are, are relatively cheap. And if we are going to go down the road of adaptive management, somebody has to pay for that. And therefore, it's something that the fish farmers may have to recognise that they will have to pay more for the right of operating a farm in order to have monitoring done to deal with all the various problems that the Eclair Committee and, and we've discussed today. Yes, um, John, I can bring you in very briefly and then I, I think I've got the final question. John, do you want to come in? Yes. I'd just like you to talk a little bit about the, the sort of the, the depositional zones and the mechanical harvesting of that waste um, in beneath um, tanks. You talk about uh, a kilometre square, which is essentially 100 yards by 100 yards. Um, so if there was a, a suspended tree, essentially, that harvested um, the fish poo, could that not work and solve many of the depositional problems in these zones uh, and deliver much of what we want to see? I think it's being trialled somewhere, I believe, in Norway. Uh, what they call a funnel system, um, which is basically what it sounds like, which is a funnel you stick underneath a fish farm which traps most of the waste. It doesn't need to be a kilometre square. It literally can be more or less the footprint of the cage. Indeed. Um, and that will trap the waste. And then, of course, you have the problem is you need to deal with that waste somehow. So you need to soak it out and yep. put it into some kind of treatment plant, um, which is not difficult technology. Um, but um, 
the problem with a, f a funnel is that it deals with one problem, which is the, the waste falling out, but it doesn't deal with the sea lice issue um, because you still get sea lice coming into the farm and you still get larvae coming out of the farm. Um, whereas if you've got... Now, there are other technologies which consist of putting a skirt around the um, farm so that um, basically you cut it off from the surface waters but allow water to come in from underneath. Now, that helps protect the farm stock from getting infestations of sea lice, but it doesn't necessarily prevent lice larvae from escaping from the farm. So actually what you do is you put the two together, you put your skirt together with your funnel, so you end up with a completely closed containment system, um, and that solves both your problems. Excellent. Well, there's a part of the solution that we're looking for. Many thanks. And it would almost be a good place to end, but, but I, I do have the, the last question, and I'm going to encourage each of the panel members to give a yes or no answer to this. Um, in your view, given current rules and regulations, can farm salmon industry growth targets be met without detriment to the wider environment? John. It won't be quite yes or no, but it's going to be nearly. Um, yes... But, <laughs> not in the current locations, and with effective monitoring prior to going into these new locations, be that, I think, temporarily into the high energy sites and long term into uh, recirculation units. Alan? Under the current regulatory regime, no. Richard? No. Guy? No. Thank you, um, and thank you all for your evidence this morning. It's been extremely interesting. Um, I am going to briefly suspend the meeting to allow you to part. I would ask committee members to remain seated uh, because we need to move on to the next subject. So thank you very much. I briefly suspend the meeting. I'm going to re reconvene the, item, uh, the meeting now and we're going to move on to agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation. This is the consideration of three negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. No emotions to annul have been received in, related to, in relation to these instruments. My question is, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to these instruments? That is agreed. That then concludes today's committee business and I now formally close the meeting.